Well, welcome everyone to our Knowledge Exchange event for today. Uh, we're excited to be presenting on the main model of corrections, uh, humanizing corrections through connections. And my job today is to introduce um, uh, Deputy Commissioner for the Main Department of Corrections, Tony Cantillo. And uh, Tony is a Deputy Commissioner and he's held previous roles as the Warden for the Main Correctional Center and Deputy Warden at the Main State Prison. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Cantillo graduated from the University of Southern Maine School of Social Work and started his DOC career as a correctional officer. So he's a broad range of experience. Uh, Tony's career focus is to promote um, the destigmatization and wellness of justice involved individuals and correctional professionals. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Tony Cantillo and to pass this on to you. Good afternoon and thank you, Shelley, and thank you for the privilege of being here with you all this afternoon. I am Tony Cantillo, the Deputy Commissioner for the Maine Department of Corrections. And as Shelley alluded, um, a background in various roles within the department and my professional career is starting out as a social worker. Uh, so uh, these topics and what we'll be speaking about today has a lot of uh, emphasis on why I do the work and I'm sure a uh, true nexus on why we're all here today. Uh, I wanna speak a little bit about um, the main model of corrections and uh, tied into our mission statement within the main department of corrections, which includes uh, making our communities safer by reducing harm through supportive intervention, empowering change, and restoring lives. And as we allow that to settle in, um, we'll speak more about that throughout the hour and a half with each other this afternoon. As we go towards our uh, discussion this afternoon, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We have a diverse group of panelists here joining us this afternoon, and you'll see them throughout uh, this afternoon in different breakout sessions um, uh, through the afternoon. So I'd like to go ahead and start with Dave. Dave, please introduce yourself to the group. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. My name is David Simpson. I've been with the department on 10 years now. My role is, uh, my title is the manager of evidence-based practices within the adult facilities which means I, I, my, go, my charge is to advance evidence-based case management, uh, programming and services, anything that is related to risk intervention. Um, a change that I've seen um, throughout, throughout the department um, since the onset of the main model of corrections is a level of collaboration that we now rely upon with our residents. Um, following me, you'll, you'll meet one of the residents. They're instrumental in policy change, work groups. Um, we've, for the last nine months, we've hosted which again is, is evident of a, of a significant cultural change. Um, a Friday afternoon Zoom, uh, residents from all of our facilities were trying to create um, a culture of recovery. Um, and it's, it's run by residents and on March 10th, um, we're all gonna convene at uh, the main correctional center in, in um, Wyndham. So, which is, you know, two, three short years ago was not feasible, was not possible. So again, it's good to be here. Look forward to uh, learning from you all today. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you. My name's Sean Libby. I'm a resident here at Maine State Prison. I've been for just a hair under 25 years. Uh, I've seen a lot of really positive change over those 25 years. A lot of more recently under this new leadership has been leaps and bounds over anything that's happened in the previous really two two decades or so. It's really kind of heartwarming to see a lot of the changes that are happening, the way things are moving forward under this main model of corrections. And it's just really a kind of a pleasure to be a part of, of, of things moving forward at the speed as which they are. So just happy to be here and happy to participate in any way I can. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for your introduction. Miriam. Hi, I'm Miriam Davidson. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and um, the statewide director of psychiatric services at the Maine Department of Corrections. I have been working at um, the prison here for about seven years. Um, I provide psychiatric care across all of the different facilities 
at the Maine Department of Corrections. I have, um, Mary, can I, may I ask you to speak closer to the mic? Oh yeah, sure, sorry. Is that better? Sounds better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, right, so did you hear some of what I said? Yeah, okay. Um, so I provide psychiatric care to uh, residents at all of our different facilities. And I have been um, a, a part of the onset of our MSO treatment. Um, some of the changes that I've seen since we've implemented the main model of corrections have included just access to individualized um, tools that can help people to recover and be more successful when they release. And I look forward to talking more about those things. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Next, we have Miranda. Welcome, Miranda. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, my name is Miranda. I've been a resident here at the Women's Center for about five years. And I must attest to that in those five years, it's it's night and day of what it was when I first got here. And it's just an environment that humanizes and it it fosters big change and education and recovery, and it's putting good citizens back into the community. Thanks, Miranda. Welcome. Jen. Um, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here. I am um, only six months into my time uh, with Maine uh, DOC, um, and I uh, just uh, taken on the regional medical director, uh, overseeing our uh, medical care of our residents um, across the state. Uh, prior to coming here, I was a family physician and also uh, specialized in addiction medicine. So I never really saw the before um, the changes to the main model that we're um, using now, but I can tell you that those changes that have taken place and the way we approach care, uh, including substance use disorder, is one of the reasons why I took this job. And I feel that it, it gives an opportunity for individuals to get the care for the chronic disease um, that they need uh, so that they can uh, be more successful and um, a whole uh, being. So I'm very excited to be part of this today. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And thank you for all our panelists and your introductions and taking the time to be with us this afternoon. As we transition into our next topic, I want to bring to attention um, a little bit more about what the Mayball of Corrections is. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in front of us is our mission statement. Main Mall of Corrections really went through a journey uh, many years, a few years ago, which started with an implementation of our new mission statement, which is before us today. And it evolved into a statement uh, developed by within our staff members and a new vision of how we would like to conduct ourselves within the corrections field. Instead of mentioning things of this is what people shall do, and this is how we're going to measure that, it's really just encompassing some key areas to include reducing harm, support of intervention, empowering change, restoring lives. The practice we'll see today, how that's emphasized, is just a, a model of normalization, humanization, with that emphasis of destigmatization and respect, com committed to promoting the safety and well being of our residents, promoting interactions on a day to day basis as we would in a healthy community. And that's really where we are as a department uh, with our partnership with WellPath and all aspects within our operations, both in the facility and in our community corrections as well. So with that being said, I'd like to move ahead with our, our discussion this afternoon and where we'll have Dave and Sean. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, I'll just start right off. With just some, something simple as that, as uh, calling the deputy commissioner by his first name and it being okay, that's a that's a huge step over the, the 25 year journey that I've had here. Um, when I first came in, I was at Thomaston, 
in the old, it was the old prison. It was back, dated back to the 1800s. It was one of those movie settings you would see with all bars. Uh, but it was just a completely different environment. Back then, the whole separation of staff and, and residents was, wasn't just something that residents felt like you don't go talk to the, the cops. It was staff felt the same way. It's like there was no interaction, no kind of humanizing. It was just they were there to do the job of, of keeping us in line. That was kind of the way it was. They were separated. You didn't deal with them a lot. You went into your living areas. They were separated in certain little cubicles. It was very different. It was a completely different environment. Um, and even things like caseworkers, and you you rely on, like nowadays you rely on caseworkers and you have a great interaction with caseworkers. Something Dave and I were talking about recently was uh, at Thomaston, they were in a completely different building. And uh, I told Dave, I said, back then it was one of those things with caseworker is you never wanted to be called to see the caseworker because it meant somebody died. That was how like infrequent you saw caseworkers. Um, they didn't really talk about case management. They didn't talk about case planning. And even when this facility opened up, uh, case managers were still like separated from residents out in the hallways between uh, massive steel sliding doors that you had to get approved to go out to see your caseworker. That was only if they wanted to see you. And it was, you know, case plans that should be a collaborative effort between the, the client and the caseworker where generally speaking, your caseworker would call you in once a year and slide a case plan. They already developed for you across the desk and said, here, sign this. And that was kind of the way case working, uh, case management worked back then. You didn't have a lot of interaction. You legitimately saw your caseworker once a year for your annual review. And that was really the, the extent of most people's interactions with a case manager. Um, and to see what it is today where case managers work in the pods where people live, interact with them on a daily basis, check in with people, have conversations, ask people what they want in their case plan, what they would like to see done, what they would like to see, what they would like to accomplish in their, in their time and constant kind of follow-ups and see how they're doing with that is a complete departure from where it used to be. And it's something Dave and I talked about. I don't know if Dave wanted to touch on that at all. I appreciate that, Sean. Great job. I um, love love interacting with you. Yeah, that, that the, my introduction really into the to the facilities. I work at a central office. Started around eight years ago, when a former deputy commissioner asked me to go assess our case management practices, which I was eager to do. And I started here at the Main State Prison. Um, and one of the first my first takeaways is when I came in, my my approach was going to be talk to staff, case managers, unit managers, and residents. Um, who at the time were not residents, they were inmates. We spoke to them by their last name. Um, and I was in a, in a housing unit here talking to a caseworker, and I went out into the day room to try to engage any resident, and they would not speak to me. They wouldn't come near me. If I went near a table, they'd disperse, um, which was curious to me because I did not understand the culture. I didn't know any of the norms. Um, but slowly and surely after a while, I was able to engage one person who then kind of the word got out, it's okay to talk to him that I wasn't the cop, that I was really here to try to see if we could improve the, you know, the, their, their lives, how they were living their lives inside the facilities. We did that across the department. Um, it took about six months to come up with an assessment and really a working plan on how do we improve um, on our effective case management. So it's really nice to hear Sean reflect on to where, where it really started, you know, some 25 years ago, to where it is today, where we, where we rely on the clients to express, you know, their assessed needs and also where do they want to be um, to, to support them in their journey across the department um, into, into uh, the reentry phase. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to talk just briefly about the before and after examples, that's the before, that's the, you know, an exercise in polarity where I couldn't get a resident to speak to me. Um, and I think it was, um, Tony may know this better than I, I think it was the summer of 21 when down at uh, Maine Correctional Center in Wyndham, they opened one walk and one dorm our normalization walk, um, which is really the main model of corrections. The first, we're gonna do this, we're gonna change the way these gentlemen live. Um, and I walked in and I was with two staff from the main state prison. And I walked down to the normalization uh, walk uh, because people wanted to see what it was. What, what, what does this look like? What, what are components of this look like? And when I walked down there, there was a resident. Um, this was right after the Language Matters Initiative. So a resident looked at me and yelled at me, Dave, and he, and his, he came up to me and he gave me a bear hug. And I looked up and behind the resident was a camera and I'm like, okay, at least I'm on camera. Um, and I immediately, 
I accepted the embrace. We sat down and I texted my boss, Ryan Thornell at the time. I said, Ryan, you need to know this just happened. And um, I was self-reporting in many, many ways. It was a boundary that was um, always very, very, very steadfast. And finally, I remember Ryan's response, uh, which represents the shift. And his response that day was, yeah, that's how sometimes people greet each other. That's totally normal, which I very, even today, today I, I appreciate that. I sit in Sean's um, housing unit frequently. Um, I have meals with them. I always feel welcome. Um, they make me laugh. They make me think. Um, Sean is, was very, very influential in a lot of his peers on several of our policy changes which have been shifted to meet the residents' needs through the residents' eyes and voice. Um, so it's really that collaboration, which, you know, not many years ago, and I've not been here for, you know, a, a great length of time, I've seen a shift from us versus them to us and we. Um, and l clearly things move forward much quicker um, when we can partner with the residency experts um, of incarceration. Um, Sean, I'm going to bounce it back to you because I'm sure something I said, I hope something I said might have triggered I thought you'd like to share it as well. Well, yeah, it kind of goes back to it wasn't it's not just the case management. It's the the staff in general, that disconnect that was there early on. That really was there. And, and I'm not going to lie. It's there's still work to be done. It still needs. But to this, to, to how it is now, the training, how staff interacts on a regular basis with residents is a completely a completely different thing. It used to be a complete separation you didn't, you know, there was that old school rule. If you went to go talk to an officer, you brought somebody with you so that they could vouch for the fact that you weren't telling on somebody and staff didn't really feel comfortable having a lot of those, those interactions because there was that thought that if you were interacting, if a resident was interacting with you as a staff person, it was only to manipulate or to try to distract you from something else happening. And that's completely changed uh, over on its head too, 180 degrees where staff is now encouraged to interact with residents on a daily basis. And, and get that kind of similar to the case management side of thing, just kind of interact, see how they're doing, what their day is, and uh, really seeing how, how things are progressing has been incredible as far as just the, the, the temperature of the place has dropped dramatically. And like Dave said, sitting down with staff and having conversations and having coffee and actually and actually doing what is normal in, in treating people like human beings, whether it's staff treating uh, residents or residents treating staff as just another human being who wants to see them do well, who staff want to see residents do well and residents want to see staff come in and, and, and enjoy their time here and enjoy their day here and not take a lot of negativity home with them is a big part of it as well. Right. I, I, well, I just say like hearing you now, so on the, um, Sean can email me right now, he, that, which is to me is just like the, a great gift as far as making things happen a little quicker. Most a lot of our residents are in school. I think maybe, Sean, you may want to talk about um, your education at some point, but in a, and also your living unit, the earned living unit that was created um, where, you know, in some of the some of the earned uh, privileges of the guys who live there. I'm not sure how many live there, um, but it's it's a I would invite everybody on this call with the deputy commissioner's permission, of course, to come up and see this, to see to see what's been created by the residents and for the residents and the benefits for the residents and staff. Um, but the fact that I can send an email out or that Sean might get an email at some point today from the deputy commissioner, the warden, you know, all these different people, like we can communicate that there's a level of trust. It's like, yeah, this is the best way to communicate. Um, and I know I, it looks like we might be ahead of schedule, Sean, as far as the time goes. But I'd love for you to share about your housing unit, some of the things. I know there was a van full of stuff that was delivered last week that I think, again, it's that that shift to well, what does corrections look like today versus, you know, 20, 25 years past. Yeah, I, I'd love to talk. I always want to talk the, the education thing that you talk about was, you know, early on, education was barely really it was kind of high set GED type stuff a few programs here and there um, that were really kind of pushed on people. Um, but now that collaboration between caseworkers and staff and residents where people kind of are allowed to kind of chart their own journey in a way. And seeing that where education has come with that is, is, is incredible. I was a part of the first ever cohort of students to go through the, the college program. And I always use my 
opportunities like this to talk about Doris Buffett and the, the gifts she gave me of education. But even early on, when we first started the college program, it was, it was tough. There was a lot of staff who were against residents getting a college education. It was tough to even get back in the education department. And even then, it was like we were handwriting papers. And now I'm sitting on a computer that I have on me all the time. I'm in a graduate program at Michigan State University studying youth development. I'm one of like seven people in this facility uh, in a graduate program. There's, I don't even know the number. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of students currently enrolled in college and are able to chart their own journey there. They're able to, with, with the access to technology that we have now, I'm on Wi-Fi in the unit I live. And three other pods in this facility have that. And it's, it's growing. It's going to spread to all the pods that are going to have access to Wi-Fi and be able to do their, their college programming. Like Dave said, emailing with people. And I'm in a unit now where that used to be segregation. That's now the earned living unit. And, and be able, like Dave said, to, to change this environment. We used to have 100 and between those 50 here, 50 next door, 132 beds dedicated in this facility to segregation. And that's a huge change to where we're at now, where I'm in a unit where we completely revamped and redid, we painted, we, we, we sanded, we completely redid this unit to an earned living unit. Um, the next door, that unit, 50 man unit is the IMHU, the intensive mental health unit that they're doing amazing things with the guys who really need that, that really one-on-one -on -one focus. And then the, the other units that have broken down between two 16 man units, I think there's five total, Dave, if I'm not wrong, that are segregation. That, so we went from having 132 dedicated beds that were filled on a regular basis to like five guys that are considered maybe segregation. And, and that's very, very short term. And it's really, and I'm, I'm sorry to jump in front of you, Sean, oh, but we're getting absolutely. the, we've got to wrap it up. And I just wanted to share this about, um, as far as the earned living unit and the, the move towards normalization, once a month, Sean and his peers, they order out to Walmart or Hannaford Live and they come in with, you know, thousands of dollars worth of fresh food to their liking, they create their own food. And also a place, a part of the uh, facility here that used to be called No Man's Land, this spring and summer will, will house the finest garden in the state of Maine, um, man manicured by uh, Sean and his peers. So I know I know where we, we hit the mark on our time. Thank you all for listening. Sean, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Dave and Sean. Obviously a lot of passion uh, with the topic. And, you know, a lot of lived experience uh, from you, Sean, to provide that context of the before and after and where we'd like to go moving forward. So what we'd like to achieve, and I think just a quick summary of what uh, Sean and Dave provided to us, it's really that emphasis on community, uh, community within our facilities. And what does that mean? It's that engagement. It's it's, it's, it's that asking of why not on how do we accomplish things instead of just a no and listening to what uh, our residents have for feedback and suggestions and along with uh, staff and coming up with a collaborative solution for that. Uh, and we believe with that ongoing development and that approach and the formalization of our operational philosophies, it's uh, transforming uh, our communities and our environments to be healthier and stronger and that those that um, are currently residents and they transition out the communities, they uh, come out with more meaningful opportunities to continue to expand upon the great work that they're doing um, within our facilities and with our community partners as well. With that, I'd like to um, shift over uh, to Shelly and continue with our next event for this afternoon. Thank you, Tony. And we are going to go into a 10 minute breakout session. And uh, I think you've heard a lot to discuss. Um, you're all going to be sent to your breakout rooms. But before you do so, and these will be put in the chat, uh, we want you to introduce yourselves to each other and um, speak about your profession or your major or what you're doing in the moment. Um, and then we really want to talk about what, what you've just heard and in what ways um, is it unexpected or interesting to you or um, what your thoughts are around them and what sparked your curiosity? What questions do you have? What thoughts do you have? And we really want you to talk to each other, not just present out, but we really want you to ask each other um, questions. And so please assign someone in your group to take notes, because we will be asking for some takeaways in the chat when we get back. So 
we're ready to navigate to the chat and um, you will be dispersed to rooms and facilitators navigate to uh, the rooms that you're assigned. So we're really interested to have um, those of you who were scribes, you might wanna put some uh, what you learned and information in the chat, but we're really interested also to hear what our panelists um, may have heard in their in their rooms and um, some of the responses to the questions you had. I know folks that I met with were really felt that they this was a very different model than they were familiar with from either lack of experience or from watching television. Um, and um, the other question that was posed was, um, what about people who are naysayers, uh, people who think that um, correctional facilities should not be uh, using taxpayer dollars to um, support and respect and provide opportunities for people who have uh, committed crimes in their in their histories. So um, I see here um, that language is also something that's being um, noted as the use of positive person-centered language has been noted, but um, I'm going to invite a couple of the panelists. You, know, you were in some of the breakout rooms. I'm curious what um, what you may have uh, seen in your in your settings. And anyone else who would like to uh, offer what you heard. We're getting a lot in the chat. Shelly, one thing I want to mention just before we allow some of the panelists to speak upon uh, their experience, but to your point, you know, speaking as a deputy commissioner for the department, um, regarding some comments regarding naysayers, as you provide examples, we are, we look at this as, you know, what, what type of investment do we want to provide? And we know that the direction that we're going is a direction in which we've tried things in the past, we know they don't work. And so spending you know, our, our investment in a different way, because one of the topics that we brought up in, in our group was in the Department of Corrections, we have the ability to answer the question of what kind of neighbor do you want? And so we take that you know, wholeheartedly. And so with that, we have the opportunity to answer that question and make choices of our investments um, within the going. So I love the terminology of investment. And I think Trisha Mason and our group spoke about the concept of everyone being a citizen and wanting everyone to be a good citizen. So it's incredibly powerful. So um, I'd like to follow up with that again. If any of our panelists would like to comment, I want to have the floor open for you. Um, we have a question here from Jessica. We are curious how they are able to make such drastic changes over such a short period of time. And Tony, I'm sure it wasn't a short period of time that you've been working on this, but how did it, how did it happen? How did you, you know, you get people to come together. You know, we talk a lot about collaborative decision-making and working, you know, having a common vision and often it's really hard to get to that common vision. So what, tell us about your process. That process included many of the themes that uh, our panelists brought up. It was really the collaborative approach. It's the, it, the spirit of finding ways on how we can do things instead of just allowing, you know, previous barriers get in the way. And we also understood that it takes uh, not just the staff members with the main department of corrections, but also our residents. They are part of the community that we work with them as well. And so with that vision and taking, you know, a deliberate step towards, you know, what we call the main model of corrections, as I mentioned, as our operational philosophy and subscribing to that, but knowing that that will continue to grow and that will continue to evolve into what we find as new opportunities, new challenges, and areas for where we can span upon that. Great, thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'd like to jump in too around the, the, the whole shift and the progress over time. I mean, from my perspective, it's about leadership, that we, had, we have clear leadership in the DOC. Um, it didn't happen overnight, and there were many, many times 
um, any DOC staff on this would say, we've stopped, we stopped, we stopped our toe. You know, it's like, well, that didn't work. And we just didn't, you know, fold our tents and give up. It's like, okay, let's try something different. Uh, but the, the, truth of the, the truth of it all is the, nay, the naysayers, that it's like the balance is shifting uh, substantially. Um, that at the end of the day, when we have communities of, of, of people that we work with to support and they, um, there's like, it, it's, it's a much more um, rewarding day at work, right? We're engaging with people. We're trying to support people versus, you know, standing back and constantly correcting. It's, um, you know, just supporting and guiding the process of change for folks is, it's very rewarding work. But I wanted to bring it back to the leadership of, uh, you know, Commissioner Liberty, Tony Cantillo, the wardens, where it's like, we're going to do this. It's Sometimes it's going to be hard, hard, hard work, but we're not going to give up. And here we are years into it and, and we've advanced. And I, I let's do this again in a year, see where we're at then. So what I'm hearing is it's mutual and it goes both ways. It's beneficial and for the residents and for the people who are working there. Sean, I saw you are you ready? Did you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted like that's the 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 collaborative the, the collaborative kind of way things work nowadays is is a huge part of I think where we got to where we're at right now because it used to be uh, I know here at this facility wardens would walk around with like a security detail and you couldn't even get a chance to talk to them and now wardens walk around alone and have conversations with people and seek people's kind of insights into things that they might be thinking about implementing or doing and they want feedback from residents. You know, being able to have conversations with Tony and still, you know, call him Tony, like I said earlier, but like having those conversations with him and having him reaching out to people and wanting to get feedback, that was never a thing. And that's a big reason that I think we got where we're at. Um, I want to touch on like the naysayer thing. We talked about it a little bit in our breakout group was, you know, even with the college thing we talked about, it was, was brought up recently that um, the national recidivism rate is around 65 to 70 percent, meaning 65 to 70 percent of people who get out of prison return within three years or so. And for the college program here of the 100 plus graduates, the recidivism rate is 5 percent. So that's a tremendous drop in the amount of new crimes, new victims, new costs to the community. And that's, you know, a, a huge difference in the amount of people returning to society better prepared to be upstanding, productive members. Um, so, you know, thinking that we shouldn't be doing some of the things that we're doing, it, the old way doesn't work. So having the leadership we have now who's willing to look at it and say, we have to think of something else and looking at places like Norway, where some of this stuff is coming from, where they have far lower recidivism rates and their prisons are, are doing things that we're, we're striving for and already accomplishing in some ways. So having that leadership is is key, and and the new way definitely seems to work better for for what we're trying to the product we're trying to put out to society. Thank you, Sean. We have a question here from our Facebook Live that I want to put out there. How can we best support residents specifically uh, at WCC, which I'm assuming is Wyndham? Um, but what what are specifics about ways to support residents? Um, I just want to touch on Tony's piece a little bit, the investment part. When you're investing in these people who society has deemed otherwise dysfunctional, malfunctional, whatever you want to use, investing in education, it doesn't just provide us with something that we can do when we get out. It's also an investment in hope. It's an investment in my self-esteem. It's an investment in my family because I am a community member. I'm somebody's sister, daughter, you know, and I'm going back out. We, you know, the mass majority of prisoners have an exit date and we're going to be returning. So that investment, I think it pays off tenfold. And I think that that, that information as data is starting to come in. Rand, I love that, that quote an investment in hope. I think that is so incredibly powerful. Thank you for that. Um, and I'd love to see people comment on that in the in the chat as well. Um, and again, I'm, uh, do you, any of you have specific um, other recommendations or ways in which folks can be 
supportive of the residents and working with the residents. We have about one minute left, so. One of the things I would say is take what you're hearing today and educate people who aren't a part of this. You know, educate those naysayers that were brought up, educate people, educate your family members, educate the people around you as to what's really happening in these facilities in this department. And, I, and let them know that, you know, there are people in here, the vast majority, like, like, like Miranda said, are gonna be released back into the community. And who do you want as your neighbor? Like, like Tony said earlier, and, and just educate them on the good things that are happening and how, how it can affect the community in a, in a much more positive way than, than the old way of doing things. So I just, to me, it's that education side of things. Take what you're hearing and pass it on. Well, that's what we're trying to do today. And we're gonna make sure you all come back again <laughs> at, another, at another time. So I think I'm gonna bring it back to uh, Chris for the next section, or I'm passing it on to Miriam. All right, um, just wanted to check and make sure, can people hear me okay? No, my, um, okay, good. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about, you know, as we've talked about this main model of corrections, and our shift in how we view our residents and our treatment. Um, one, of the, one of the big shifts that occurred for us in um, 2019, as you can see here in this thing, is that we, we began to expand our access to treatment for substance use disorders. And that included offering medications specifically to help substance use disorders. Um, this was something that uh, came to light as, some, as something we needed to do moving forward to help people when they're returning to the community um, as we began to face the opiate epidemic and um, the, the impact that was having on our community, it was clear that the Department of Corrections needed to play a bigger role in treatment. So in 2019, um, you know, we gathered a group, a, a steering committee group to um, begin to consider how we would offer medications for substance use disorder. And in 2019, we started a pilot, which included a smaller set of residents at, at three of our five facilities. Um, the residents that were chosen to be treated were folks that were within 90 days of release, again, to try to help support some of that transition back to the community. As we began that treatment and saw the uh, benefits of that, we began to expand. It was clear that we needed to be offering this treatment, not just to those who were leaving in 90 days, but to those who were um, getting, who, who required the treatment. So in 2020, we expanded it to all of our facilities. We expanded the time period from uh, 90 days from release to six months. Um, and then anybody who arrived to our facility from the county jails who was already taking a medication for substance use disorder, this medication was not discontinued and we continued it. Um, and then we started looking at um, universal access for everybody who was involved, um, who was appropriate for treatment. So in 2021, um, we phased out the um, inductions, you know, and, and just began normalizing access for anybody who was medically appropriate after meeting with the team and being assessed. If they were medically appropriate, they were able to get it. Um, we have, at, in 2021, we normalized some of the medication lines. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these things in just a minute. We allowed, and again, had the universal access. And then in 2022, this past year, we've started focusing some more on harm reduction training, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. These um, distributing the harm reduction kits, again, something we'll talk a little bit more about later. But um, since doing that, we've, we've sent out about 1,800 of the kits. So. Um, you know, the the idea around starting to offer the medication for substance disorders really was a part of the main model of corrections in looking at a holistic approach to treatment for residents and a delivery of care where we're providing the, the tools and the access to treatment, even in spite of stigma or concerns about safety and just making sure that people have access to the treatment they need. 
This required a collaboration between security and medical. So the medical team helps offer the, the medication and the security team helps us to manage the medication safely because if the medication is, is misused or given to somebody who doesn't really need it, it can cause some issues. So it does require some monitoring and partnering together between the medical team and the correctional team really is what allowed us to be able to um, begin providing this treatment safely across the facilities. Um, as we mentioned, you know, language matters. This was a big thing for medication and substance use disorder, you know, to beginning to speak with people um, not as addicts or, or a junkie or things like that, but beginning to speak with people as this is, this is a person who, who suffers from a, a substance use disorder and they require treatment. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit in our breakout group about how the, the change from convict to inmate to prisoner to offender to now resident, you know, you can sort of see the progression along of how we're trying to identify um, that we're working with people who need treatment um, and just destigmatizing, humanizing things. Um, one of the big things that I, I wanted to talk about a little bit, this normalization of medication lines. So when we first started the program, um, which mostly uh, we offer three different types of medication, which we'll talk a little bit about, but one of the medications or um, the Suboxone is a medication that's used that requires some monitoring. And when we first started it, it was very sort of um, militaristic almost, you know, you had to get your medication and sit down at a table and put your hands on the table and you couldn't move or talk for 15 minutes just to make sure that you didn't, you know, give the medication away and people were sort of separated out. And so it was, it was really um, a, um, not a very holistic sort of patient-centered way of doing it. So we began to say, well, let's normalize the treatment and offer it like any other medication. When you go up to the medication window and you get your medication for high blood pressure or for a headache, you also get your medication for your substance use disorder. Um, people aren't required to sit and stay. We do a mouth check really quick when somebody comes and then they, they go back to their room and, and you, you trust that the person is taking the medication like it's prescribed. Um, so those are, you know, we, um, and then the last thing I would talk about just a little bit is our um, better outcomes for those who are releasing to help people to get to um, be more successful when they get out. You know, when somebody releases to the community, it's a really high risk time for overdose and relapse. Um, and so these are times when we're really looking to try to make sure people have treatment, they have follow-up appointments, um, the harm reduction kits are a really important piece of this, of making sure people have access to Narcan and fentanyl test strips, and they've been educated about what to do and, and how, to, how to best move forward in reducing the harm um, inside of their opiate use disorder or substance use disorder. So um, I'll pass it on now to, to Jen and Miranda, who will talk a little bit more about um, the MSUD treatment. Yeah, good afternoon again, guys. Um, she touched on quite a bit of what I wanted to tell you about, um, but I also wanted to just really reiterate a few different facts. Addiction issues, the attitude has changed from a behavior, uh, you know, something that someone is doing wrong when they're doing drugs to that of being something more of along the lines of an illness or a disease because nobody wakes up and says, hey, I'm, I'm going to go be an addict today. You know, we'll just start that. It doesn't work that way. And by the time you want to turn around, it's too late. Uh, the most heartbreaking thing, though, here when I first got here was watching people leave and not because they were leaving, but because you didn't know if you'd ever see them again. These women were dying. And I'm sure that that was the same at MSP and everywhere else. But every every goodbye hug could have been the last, and it was heart wrenching. And since they've started the MAT program, that has significantly dropped. You know that I'm not 
as worried when people leave, you know, when I see you again. Um, we also have a fantastic recovery coach program here. Um, we have a group, I want to say there's just eight of us right now that are CCAR certified in recovery coaching. And uh, it changed my life forever. It gave me a purpose here. It gave me something to to get up for something to and help people um and just seeing some of them how successful they are now you know like one of them i opened a magazine and i was like oh my god <laughs> you know that was my recovery a couple years ago so as that mat program branched out as well um you know there was some issues but we're doing something that's never been done before you know that we are paving a direction that other people will follow um, in the DOC. When I, we kind of touched on that in the group, you know, were other facilities, you know, doing that. And I don't, I think they're trying. Um, but there's a lot of aspects of this place that are just, it's a very unique place. I have a wooden door with a key. I have a window I can open. Anytime I'm at rec, I can go outside. And last year I spent barefoot in the garden in the greenhouse. Um, so they're really, really focused on lifting people. Um, I'm so grateful to be in the Women's Center. Uh, things have changed drastically the last few years. Um, I'm not a resident, I'm not a prisoner anymore. I am a resident. I'm not an addict or a junkie. I have substance abuse disorder. I might not always see eye to eye with the staff, but I'm 100% respectful. I use my manners. I don't engage. And I'm not going to sell you a story of everything being okay because it's not, but I have no problems with any staff members. We all have good and bad days. Um, it's like a hose trying to put out a fire. You know, it gets kinked up occasionally. That's just something that happens. Um, as a community, we're now working together side by side with staff to make the MAT program a safe thing for everybody, because not everyone here is on MAT. Not everyone here has a addiction past or any, you know, relation to it. So we, again, we're a small community and we have to really encompass so many different variables because there's people here with addiction issues. There's women here with eating disorders, mental illness, anxiety, depression. And to have all of those personality types in one place is very challenging. And I would like to say that the DOC does work very hard to accommodate those things. Um, I'm also, and Dave spoke about this earlier, I'm a representative for my facility and a committee called the Resident Recovery Steering Committee we are working on building a sustainable model of recovery throughout the DOC. And it's going to work the same for every facility, but it's also going to be flexible enough to adapt to those unique needs. Um, we also plan to create, write, and advocate for new policies dedicated to recovery, um, which is, and we're getting together on the 10th, which is something that is not done. Men and women are not you know, we don't sit in the same room and work together. So we're setting new precedents all the time. And it seems like why it is things are changing so fast, because the people are just so responsive to it, you know, that you can change something and we're just soaking it up. Um, and that's allowing us to really, you know, evolve at the rate that we are. Um, and education, I cannot speak enough on education. It's I believe it's the doorway that leads you out of here and never back. You know, if you're, you know, someone who has a four year degree in something, you don't have to work for that fast money. You don't have to live in those bad neighborhoods that you can literally lift yourself up and you can walk out of the DOC right now, any person you want to be, anybody. You don't have to leave here as just a felon. You don't have to leave here with just, you know, that that's nothing and go to nothing. You have a release plan. You have an education. You are somebody. You are somebody to be proud of. And I think instilling that pride and that hope in people is just, it's, I can't even describe it. It's, I don't, 
it's working. That's my bottom line is it's working. It might not be perfect all the time, but it's working. We're working together to fix what isn't. And I see just a very bright future for the DOC because I am on the first name basis with a lot of staff members. Um, I do have the ability to email different staff members. I have a computer that's on me 24 hours a day that I complete my education with and I get on Zooms when I need to. And I'm not, you know, I'm not hovered over or, you know, monitored as much because I am getting the trust that I've earned. Um, I've proved to the people here that the staff that I don't need that monitoring that I am self sufficient and I'm being given that little bit of breathing room that wasn't there five years ago, you know, everything was monitored, everybody was the same. And, you know, just being able to move in this new direction together, like we are a DOC, but we're not a DOC of staff and inmates, we, we are the DOC. And that is why it's working. Wow, oh, Miranda, you have such an ability to share in a way that that is so meaningful. So I, I really appreciate Thank you. I really appreciate you coming and doing this and sharing with us. I um I don't know, Jen, if you had anything to add really briefly about. I, I think we're close on our time, but anything um, else you want to add from the medical perspective? Yeah, I think it's really hard to add anything after Miranda. I mean, Miranda, <laughs> yeah. you're the real deal. You and Sean are the real deal. You are the people that is making the model work because you're willing to work the model and you make our jobs easier and certainly very, um, very fulfilling. Um, so thank you. I, I think from a medical perspective, I think, you know, really important and, and you brought this up to remember that addiction is a disease. And uh, if somebody comes in and has diabetes, I treat their diabetes. And so I think that this has been an amazing opportunity that we're treating addiction. And yeah, there's things that still need to change. It's a work in progress, um, but it's, it's an incredible journey. So I think, uh, Miranda, I think you said it all. So thank you. And I just wanted to share one more plug. I think, um, you know, that we're one of the things we're looking at moving forward is helping, having you help us or having folks help us with these harm reduction kits that we have um, been putting together. And as I mentioned earlier, we've done about 1800 of them so far. And I have attended, I have attended um, one of these events with the UNE students who help us to put these kits together. And without that help, it would not be possible. Um, it, it's a heavy lift, but it, it's so meaningful and it's such a fun time to hang out together and be able to talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it, it feels like something you're really impacting the community with. So I, I just want to, it looks like we have a code up here where you can scan if you want to volunteer to sign up to do this. I'll, I'll be at the event to help um, with the packing and I, and I hope that we can see some students there too because it's so great to work together as a community about that. So, and I think it goes back to Shelly now. I think it's for me now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Miranda, Miriam, and Jen. So inspiring, so informative. We really appreciate your sharing of everything. And so we're going to go to a final breakout and please the people who are here come to the breakout session and enjoy a conversation applying what you've learned to a case study that um, has been put together um, in collaboration with the DOC. Um, so I am going to um, just briefly read this uh, study to you and then uh, we will talk about the, the questions and we'll put you right into your breakouts. So this is about Paul. Paul is 20 years old and is at the Maine Correctional Center serving a two-year sentence for drug trafficking. He sustained injuries in a bike accident and was given short-term prescription for pain medication. Subsequently, he failed out of his second year studying culinary arts at a local community college. Paul acknowledges that he struggled with using his prescription pain pills as prescribed. 
He resorted to using uh, street fentanyl when his prescription ran out. And during his short stay at the county jail, he reports buying another resident Suboxone in lieu of the fentanyl. When admitted to the MCC, he appeared to be in opioid withdrawal. He described vomiting and diarrhea and was yawning and sweating when seen by the healthcare staff. And a provider uh, pres prescribed Paul a maintenance dose of 60 milligrams of Suboxone, which appeared to help stabilize his health condition. And so um, we're going to go into uh, 10 minutes. And what we'd like you to think about are the following. And we will put these in the chat. Uh, what are your initial thoughts and concerns about Paul and his current struggles and situation? What would you like to ask him? Um, and what have you learned thus far in your program, in your distinctive programs that can be applied to Paul's health care and well-being? And so we're going to sort you again into your rooms and to have a 10-minute discussion about Paul, and then we'll come back for last comments to uh, talk about the conversation about Paul. And again, I'd really like to open it up to our panelists to, you know, share share their ideas. And um, we've got some notes here already. Um, uh, one great comment is the opposite of addiction is connection. And I think that's incredible. Um, so anyone want to comment on their session? Uh, or comment in general. We've got a little bit of time to uh, hear hear what people have to say or ask questions. We've got time for Q and A here. I have well, a question. Go for it. Um, so I had a question on um, with the residents. Like, does everyone have an equal opportunity to like further their education, or like how I was a little confused on how that works. Like, if it's just offered to ev everyone or. It was like only specific residents. No, education is offered to everybody, but some people have to start in different places. Some of these guys don't have a GED even, so they couldn't start college even if they wanted to. They have to go through the GED process first, and then you file your FAFSA, which I'm sure all of you guys know what that is. And yes, but to stay in college and succeed in college, that is a decision that's on an individual level you know it does it does require somebody to be in a in a good place to engage in the education so if they aren't at a certain level or if they're having issues with they're unstable or maybe um having issues with fighting or things like that there may be some things that hold you back from being able to engage but as soon as you sort of stabilize or you're you're appropriate to engage in those things safely certainly are able to do so. Great. Um, if I may, we had a question in, in our room and um, Brooklyn, do you wanna ask the question since you were the one who brought it to our attention? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I work with a lot of clients that do use Suboxone as that medicated assistance treatment. I work in child welfare. Um, so my question, like knowing how Suboxone works, and sometimes it can take quite a long time to work on tapering down that dose to where you feel like you're mentally ready to be off of Suboxone. Does the facility coordinate with <clears throat> like outside uh, facilities or behavioral health places or MAT programs and stuff like that? So that if after that two year sentence, he still needs that Suboxone or even those mental health services that that's going to be coordinated after discharge. It, Melissa, do you want to? Say. Is that okay for me to talk to that? I, yeah. I'm not a panelist, but yeah. So we um, work extensively with community organizations to set people up. So every person in the last three years, 100% of the people who have left from us have had a community appointment for their MAT um, within seven to 10 days of their release, many of them within three days of release. Um, we release them with enough medication to get them to that appointment. Um, we have specific navigators in each of our facilities who help set up those community appointments. Um, we have ongoing meetings with community providers about MAT, really to make sure that we're not dropping the ball with getting 
um, folks continue continuous care um, as they as they leave us. And if people are interested in tapering off, we certainly, and I can turn that over to Miriam and Jen, we certainly um, support them in, in that and help them understand, you know, what some of the risks might be, um, particularly in that immediate time after release. Um, but we, we absolutely have um, supports for doing that. <laughs> Thanks. That's awesome. Great. Other questions? For comments, we've got a lot of comments on the tap uh, in the chat. Um, remembering everybody has struggles with everyday life, and being able to ask for help is really important. Um, that every profession has something to contribute uh, to helping in the healthcare setting. Um, our group talked about the need for awareness of trauma informed care. Um, and I don't know uh, if that's a specific philosophy that you are using at um, uh, the main correctional facilities, uh, but it's one that uh, folks have talked about in the chat and in the breakouts. So, um, yeah, the, the trauma informed care is something that we are doing. You know, everybody who arrives to the facility is screened uh, right away for, you know, ACEs and, and some of looking at how we can help our treatment to be um, more trauma informed and centered. So it is something that we, we do use. Great. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity for final words. Um, David, I see you're unmuted. Maybe you might like to give final words to our, our students and back to everybody who's here. Sure, I'll do my best for myself. Um, this has been great. It's been a fast hour and a half. There's so many more things. I, I'm sure I, I'm not gonna speak for Miranda and Sean. I spend a lot of, I spend more time with the residents than I do with staff. Um, so many more things that I'd like to share about where we're, where we've been and where we're going. Um, the good news is I think we're on track. Um, I think nationally, a lot of states, uh, can, uh, Tony can tell you about this. They come in to see how we do it. What are you doing and how are you doing it? Um, we're building a sustainable change. We're changing corrections. We're transforming lives. Um, and and I can honestly, I, I, I don't think that knowing the person that I was when I first came to DOC, if we hadn't made this shift, I'm not so sure how long you know I would have lasted. Um, uh, the whole concept of treating people um, as human beings and valuing them as human beings, what a concept. And that's that's the direction we're going. So I'm pleased with so many people here today. I hope we do this again soon. Um, and I hope you're all, I hope this was a, a value added afternoon for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, would you like to say a few words and then we'll have Miranda close us out. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to kind of echo what Dave said. Just thanks for the opportunity to, to be here and kind of share what is going on here just to better educate uh, some of you all. And hopefully that can sprinkle out in the community of kind of the, the really good things that are happening. And just the, you know, we talked about it in some of in our breakout groups. One of the things we talked about was the reduce in, in segregation. Like I live in, in the urban living unit that we discussed a little bit. We have an oven and, a, and, and refrigerators and we get groceries and we're able to cook food as a group. Um, but this used to be segregation. Next door used to be segregation. That's the IMHU, the Intensive Mental Health Unit. They do a lot of really good things with, with people over there that really need that more focused care. Um, we used to have 132 beds dedicated to segregation. And now we have 32 total beds that are dedicated to segregation, but only right now like five are actually being used and it's very short term. So just that drop, and I can't remember, Tony might be able to say it, it's something the warden and the commissioner talk about a lot, that within a couple of years ago, the number of assaults on staff was like 80 something in a year. And last year in 2022, it was down to like five. So just the way those types of things, the environment that we're creating here at the other facilities where it's a lot more of a, of a community focused uh, approach to how everybody deals with each other. And it's something that, like uh, Dave talked about, that we're, you know, we see in our unit a lot. We're getting a lot of people coming in from other facilities in other states to come in and get some ideas on how they can uh, progress uh, their their their, their uh, departments to kind of match what we're doing. Uh, so it's just 
uh, you know, like Dave said, I, I could spend a, another hour and a half talking about some of the really good things that are going on. Um, so I just appreciate the time and uh, wrap it up, Miranda. Yeah. Final words to get the last minute here, Miranda. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's an actual pleasure to have you here to listen, um, to learn. And I really, really hope that you guys take our message and that you spread it tenfold. Um, because the more people that understand that we came here and we are being corrected, the name of the building here, um, that's happening and that we are valuable people. We have purpose and there's some of the most extraordinary people I've ever met behind these walls. So, you know, don't, don't let that incarceration piece be the first thing you judge somebody by because it's not who I am. It, this is a chapter in my life, but it won't be the last chapter of my life. Um, just thank you all for being here. And as far as Dave and the RRSC committee that I spoke to you guys about, just thought you would know, and Dave loves this story. It was started by one resident and one letter to the deputy commissioner. And look where we are. Thank you so much. Before we close out, I want to give a big shout out to Melissa Caminiti, who really helped us develop this program for today and everybody who's been involved. And if you want to keep the conversation going, next Wednesday at the same time, we're going to be hosting an in-person um, conversation cafe to follow up on everything we've learned today from our panelists. Um, thank you. Thank you all very, very much. And please submit your attendance for those of you who are still here. So thank you all and um, have a great day.